every week we, Kristen specifically, pulls these sermons out of the Sundays and the Wednesdays and posts them separately. And so I know exactly how long every one of my sermons is. And I know about how long it usually is on Wednesday, and I try to keep it to about that length. But I am afraid that with Hildegard, I could go on and on and on just giving you her CV. It could be 20 minutes of me just telling you what it was she did. This remarkable woman that so many of us know very little about, I think. She was a noble woman living in what was called the High Middle Ages in Germany. And as a child, when she was still quite young, she was sent to live with a somewhat older teenager, still really, who was at that time living as a hermit. Together, they formed a religious community for women, which grew and grew and eventually outgrew its, its premises and had to move and began new houses and so on. And all through that, there was an attempt on their part, and indeed they were successful, in gradually moving this, this religious life run by women away from the interference of male leaders of the church. So one, and perhaps the first thing to know, is that she had some role in women's spirituality and in, in, in sort of early Christian feminism. At some point in her life, around the time that she was 38, apparently, this, this older woman she had, been, had had as her mentor died, and Hildegard was elected the abbess of her, the, the superior of her order. And so she had some role also in, in, in organizing the church. In that role, she came to be in contact with lots of powerful people and apparently was able, through her all, through all her life, to be influential in the way that she spoke, even to those who were quite powerful. There's a story from the very end of her life that uh, her community got into trouble because they buried an unbaptized or unshriven, one who had not been forgiven, man in their graveyard. And the local bishop uh, forbade them to receive the Eucharist. And so Hildegard went to the archbishop and argued the case and won. So she was someone who had convincing speech. Yet another thing, all through her life, it seems, she had visions which she kept to herself for much of her early life. But when she was 43, she had a vision that told her she should write them down and publish them. So she did. An unusual thing for a woman to do at the time, to write anything, let alone to write a book of the vision she had received from God. And you can imagine there would have been a certain amount of danger in that. Because whenever someone is talking about the, the, the personal revelation that they've had from God, there is the danger that they will be perceived as heretical doesn't seem to have stopped Hildegard. She wrote this book and eventually it received the approbation of the church all the way up to the Pope. So a writer of mystical visions. She also supervised the illuminations that are in this book, which we still have right down to this day along with the book. And they are considered classics of Christian mystical art. She has a role somehow in, in visual art and our understanding of what it might mean to imagine God through the eyes of someone who has had a very personal and intimate contact with God. Living in a religious community, obviously she had a need to be in the daily office, to be reciting the prayers of the church, singing the psalms of the church. The people who live in religious communities do, and some who don't live in religious communities live in the world do as well. So she wrote musical settings, these that we still have also, and you can still, you go to YouTube, look it up, you can hear the, the music of Hildegard of Bingen. And right down to today, even in our modern jaded ears, it still sounds otherworldly, what this woman wrote over a thousand years ago. But she was a composer of music. When her free time, apparently, and apparently she did have free time, she wrote about medicine on a variety of topics. She wrote about natural history on a variety of topics, and she's considered to be one of the, the founders of the field in Europe of study of the natural world. She wrote about trees. She wrote about the elements. She wrote about weather. She wrote about all kinds of things you would never have imagined. And all these things, we still have some echo of her even down to this present time. This woman who did so many and so varied things in the course of her long life. For us, I think there are a couple of things to take away from all of that fascinating history. Certainly, go away and read what she wrote and listen to what the music she composed. 
But also, keep in mind that what we find in this are some messages for you and for me. We never can imagine that God is done with us. How dangerous it is ever to imagine that we have received everything we are going to receive. We're all we're ever going to be. I suspect God has far more interesting plans for most of us than we realize. And it is probably only when we are open to something new coming into our lives, into our hearts, some new fascination coming upon us, that we are truly in touch with what it is God desires for each one of us. And then also the idea that perhaps labor, laboring in obscurity isn't always a bad thing. Hildegard kept all this to herself for a long time. She lived her entire life in a, a cloistered setting. She, she didn't run around the world. For most of the time, she lived in this community of, of religious women. To imagine that there's no value in what goes on in each one of our hearts is also a mistake. To imagine that which we cherish of our understanding of our relationship with God has no value is to undervalue it. So, dear friends, Hildegard of Bingen, one who had many talents, who went in many directions, reminds us always to be open to what it is God is doing in each one of our hearts, as new and as strange as it may seem. Amen.